Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Hancock Whitney Corporation's second quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, this call may be recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Catherine Mistich, Investor Relations Manager. Please go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon. During today's call, we may make forward-looking statements. We would like to remind everyone to carefully review the safe harbor language that was published with the earnings release and presentation and in the company's most recent 10-K and 10-Q, including the risks and uncertainties identified therein. You should keep in mind that any forward-looking statements made by Hancock Whitney speak only as of the date on which they were made. As everyone understands, the current economic environment is rapidly evolving and changing. Hancock Whitney's ability to accurately project results or predict the effects of future plans or strategies or predict market or economic developments is inherently limited. We believe that the expectations reflected or implied by any forward-looking statements are based on reasonable assumptions, but are not guarantees of performance or results. And our actual results and performance could differ materially from those set forth in our forward-looking statements. Hancock Whitney undertakes no obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statements, and you are cautioned not to place undue reliance on such forward-looking statements. Some of the remarks contain non-GAAP financial measures. You can find reconciliations to the most comparable GAAP measures in our earnings release and financial tables. The presentation slides included in our 8K are also posted with the conference call webcast link on the Investor Relations website. We will reference some of these slides in today's call. Participating in today's call are John Harrison, President and CEO, Mike Ackery, CFO, and Chris Aluka, Chief Credit Officer. I will now turn the call over to John Harrison. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon to everyone. The second quarter of 2023 exhibited the continued benefits and challenges of the current operating environment. Our balance sheet remains solid with loan growth funded by both client deposit growth and cash flow from the securities portfolio. The precautionary liquidity added in March was eliminated in May as planned, so by June 30 we were back to normal levels of liquidity. As expected, loan growth moderated somewhat this quarter. Total loans were up $384 million, primarily driven by project draws in multifamily real estate, small to medium ticket business lending, and mortgage. As a note, about 60% of the volume we show as mortgage growth on slide 8 is in reality reclassification to mortgage from construction as residential projects are completed. Our indirect auto portfolio continues to amortize but has now reached generally immaterial levels. As of mid-year, demand continues to soften in new construction, middle market, and corporate banking as disciplined pricing, more conservative terms, inflationary pressure, and debt costs sideline clients waiting for a more advantageous borrowing moment. Interestingly, demand in small and medium business ticket items is more resilient as economic activity in that space remains brisk. The net effect is a slowing of net loan growth, but becoming more granular with better yields and in more self-funding sectors. So we would say at this point, the efforts of the Federal Reserve Bank to slow economic activity down a bit seem to be taking hold, and thankfully without creating any significant recessionary pressures. Looking forward, we expect further moderation in our loan growth will be driven by selective appetite in CRE, a focus on full relationship banking, and disciplined loan pricing and terms. Within investor CRE, growth in second quarter was 90% multifamily and 10% industrial, which we expect to continue in the short run. We maintained our guidance for the year with loan growth expected to finish the year in low to mid-single digits. We continue to maintain a seasoned, stable, and diversified deposit base. As shown on slide six of the investor deck, consumer and wealth deposits make up 49% of the deposit base, while the remainder is comprised of 11% public funds, 35% commercial and small business, and only 5% brokered CDs. Uninsured deposits are 34%. The ICS product, which is available to clients as a way to insure deposits above FDIC limits, has stabilized after an initial and brief surge following the March bank failures. 
We remain pleased with the quality of our book of deposits. However, growth remains a challenge in today's environment. While we reported deposit growth of $430 million this quarter, it is important to note that growth was influenced by a couple of factors. During the quarter, we issued broker deposits of $590 million to support lending activities. Late in the quarter, we received approximately $250 million in temporary trust deposits. These deposits were invested by our clients shortly after quarter end. DDA Remix continued this quarter given the current banking environment drives promotional CD pricing. Clients are highly rate sensitive and we don't expect that will go away anytime soon, especially if we see another rate hike this month. Where CDs reprice in second half 23 is a meaningful part of the NIM story going forward, which Mike will address further in his comments. Our guidance for deposit growth in 2023 remains unchanged. However, given the continued pressure on gathering DDAs, ongoing mix shift and increasing betas, we have updated our guidance for PPNR for the year and now expect PPNR to decline 1 to 3% from 2022. Earnings and a lower level of tangible assets contributed to improving capital levels. TCE was up 34 basis points to 7.5% and Tier 1 at 11.83% improved 23 basis points. We have been and continue to be cognizant of the current macroeconomic environment that is impacting our industry. We've maintained a robust ACL, we have solid capital and multiple sources of liquidity, which will help us manage through any continuing volatility. We remain confident in our ability to remain strong and stable as we have for 124 years. With that, I'll turn to Mike for further comments. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Second quarter's net income totaled $118 million, or $1.35 per share. Those levels were down $8.7 million and $0.10 cents per share, respectively. PPNR was $158 million for the quarter and was also down $9.2 million. The challenges we face as an industry from rates and deposits, both mix and betas, has led to higher than expected NIM compression, in turn driving link quarter decreases in net interest income and earnings. Our cost of deposits increased again in the second quarter to 1.4% from 0.91% last quarter. For the month of June, our cost of deposits was 1.57%. That drove our total deposit data for the quarter to 104% or 28% cycle to date, or 25% excluding the recently issued brokered CDs. We expect that our total deposit data for the cycle could now approach 35%, assuming the Fed raises rates to 5.5% in July and holds through year end. The reality of higher rates for longer and the growing dependence on CDs as a non-interest bearing deposit remix destination is driving this reality. Reminder that our total deposit data in the last uprate cycle was 29%. As was the case in the first quarter, our deposits in the second quarter continue to remix between non-interest bearing deposits and primarily time deposits. Our mix of non-interest bearing deposits to total deposits moved from 43% at March 31st to 40% at June 30th. Given the pressure on deposit cost and assumed continued remix of non-interest bearing deposits, we do see additional NIM compression in the second half of 2023, although likely at a slower pace than what we experienced in the first half of the year. Again, assuming Fed funds tops out at 5.5%, we could see NIM compression of about five to eight basis points in each of the next two quarters. Included in our assumptions is the expectation that our non-interest bearing deposit mix could fall to just below pre-pandemic levels by the end of the year, or about 35%. Slides 14 and 15 in the deck provide additional details related to our NIM and interest rate sensitivity. Turning to credit, criticized levels were relatively stable and have been for several quarters. We did have an uptick in non-accrual loans as those levels have begun to normalize. Net charge-offs were down 3.4 million from last quarter and came in at six basis points of average loans. During the quarter, we built reserves by 4.2 million, which resulted in a solid ACL 
of 1.45% to loans at June 30th. The income improved this quarter, driven by increases in service charges on commercial accounts and specialty income. Expenses were up slightly in quarter, driven by higher insurance and regulatory costs, but also higher technology-related costs. Otherwise, expenses were well-controlled. We have continued to reinvest back into the company through additional revenue-generating staff, technology improvements, and automation, all leading to increases in personnel and technology-related expense. We intend to continue these reinvestments to support adding additional value in the future, but of course are paying attention to the impact of inflation on expenses during a challenging top-line revenue environment. We are pleased to see stability in other expense categories, and as noted previously, we will have to manage through items outside of our control, such as retirement costs, benefits, insurance costs, as well as normal FDIC assessment increases. All of this leads to a few updates to guidance called out on slide 20 reflecting both second quarter activity as well as changes in the operating environment. John mentioned the change to the PPNR guidance, but we have also updated guidance on fees, expenses, and the efficiency ratio. One important note, the PPNR and expense guidance does not include any impact from the expected FDIC special assessment related to the March 2023 bank failures. I will now turn the call back to John. Thanks, Mike. And moderator, if we could, let's open the call for questions. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. Once again, that is star one to ask a question. We'll go first to Michael Rose, Raymond James. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking my questions. Um, Mike, I appreciate the the commentary around the NIB mix, um, you know, settling a little bit lower than maybe what you had talked about before. You know, can you just give us a sense for the the realm of confidence uh, or the range of confidence here that that 35 percent roughly is kind of the floor? And you know, um, what would be kind of the the, the puts and takes there? Because I think we're just trying to get a sense for, you know, um, you know, are we uh, approaching a bottom here in terms of of mix shift and uh, you know beta expectations? Thanks. Yeah, Michael. Uh, obviously, this is Mike. Be glad to and. Um, you know, the, uh, the 35% mix that we kind of called out is really what we're looking at that to come in at really toward the end of this calendar year. So obviously this quarter we came in at 40%. We could see that trajectory kind of move into around 37% or so by the end of the third quarter and then down to maybe 35% by the end of the fourth quarter. And uh, obviously, you know, it's this environment related to higher rates for longer that's driving that. But then also, if you look at our average account balances, you know, they're still about 20 to 25 percent higher now compared to where they were pre-pandemic. So um, I think to get full confidence on, on where that NIB, NIB mix actually ends up, we really need rates to start to come down, and we need that average account balance also to come down some. So the 35 percent is what we're looking at by the end of this year. And uh, into 24, I mean, obviously, we're, we're not here to give guidance for 2024, but certainly if we don't have lower rates and we don't have that average account balance down, you know, we could end up lower than 35% as we move into 24. But, you know, for now, our focus is um, pretty high confidence that I think it will be around that 35% level by the end of this year. Thanks for the call, Mike. Maybe just as a follow-up, just switching to, um, you know, expenses. I think they were a little bit higher than what I was looking for. And, you know, you raised the, the, the guidance a little bit. Can you just talk about some of the expense reduction efforts? I, I understand you're investing in the franchise, the technology investments, things like that. But, you know, just given the pressure on, on spread revenue, um, you know, what kind of actions would, you know, could we expect to see you guys take to, you know, to get that efficiency ratio down back closer to your uh, your CSOs. I know it's uh, 10 quarters out from here, but just trying to get a better sense of, you know, what actions you could take. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we did a lot of hard work throughout our company to get our efficiency ratio down to the levels that we reported the last couple of quarters. So, um, 
you know, there's certainly no joy in being above or slightly above 55% like we are right now. But uh, going forward in terms of uh, continuing to control expenses, I mean, that, that's something that I think everyone knows is pretty well institutionalized at our company. And uh, it's something that we, we focus on and I think do a good job of. The things that are kind of driving the, uh, the change in expense guidance compared to last quarter really have to do with visibility that we have in the second half of the year to certain expense categories. We called out higher pension, higher regulatory costs, and then higher insurance costs related to the P&C insurance on our, our facilities. So we, we really do look at those as kind of one-off items. And I think if you look at the change guidance, so the 75 to 8.5%, if you back out all retirement costs and all regulatory costs, kind of that core expense run rate is more in the neighborhood of 5 to 6%. But, uh, but getting to your question directly, um, again, we'll continue to focus on, on expense reduction and expense control. We've talked in the past around standing up, you know, a very professional and very effective strategic procurement process. That process is becoming mature, and we certainly expect to uh, harvest expense savings, you know, through the full implementation of that program. Uh, you mentioned reinvesting back in the company. That's something we feel strongly about continuing to do. Uh, I mentioned that in the prepared comments. And John, I don't know if you wanted to add a little bit of color around your thoughts around. I'll be glad. Investment. I'll be glad to. I think. I mean, you answered a lot of the. Uh, I think of the question already. I won't take too much time. But, but Michael, uh, and this is John. You know, we've invested a great deal of money in technology over a number of years. And in the last two or three years, the bulk of that technology spend was was about 75% toward uh, frontline effectiveness in terms of implementing Salesforce throughout the revenue-bearing part of the company, uh, a much more professional marketing and lead generating and lead follow-up organization, and all those things happen. And, and we've done, I think, done some some good work and had some good news coming back. And you don't have to look any further than the. The, uh, the continued growth in both deposits and loans in the small and mid-sized ticket area of business lending to see that benefit. At the same time, as we're rolling out all that technology, I mean, the turnover rate in our industry has been horrendous, and we've not been immune to that, particularly in the hourly levels. So some of the productivity improvement I expected by this time to get due to some of that automation really hasn't fully been realized yet, and I'd like to see that get completed. So between that work, the strategic procurement area that Mike mentioned, um, and I think some thoughtful consideration of how long we should expect to take in this environment given the spread differences for the revenue-bearing individuals we've hired to, uh, to get up to their full profitability. Um, I, I think that's probably where we focus for the next couple of quarters. So uh, I think Mike's word choice was good. There's no joy being above 55. Um, I, I, about half of that driver were things that we really couldn't control. Uh, but, but, you know, what goes up will come down and the assessments will decrease. The insurance costs will eventually decrease both on property and an FDIC. Um, and, and I think I'd, I'd like to see a little bit better efficiency uh, in our back of the house through some of the automation over the next couple of quarters. So we've got some work to do there uh, if we're going to continue the reinvestment pace we've been on. But I appreciate the question. Hey, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Appreciate the color. You bet, Michael. Thank you. The next question comes from Casey here, Jeffries. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon, guys. Um, I guess okay. a, a question on uh, capital. Um, you know, uh, you guys, uh, you know, approaching 12% on CET1. Um, I think I know the answer, but just want to just curious as to your, your appetite for, for buybacks. Yeah, Casey, this is Mike. So appreciate the question on, on capital. And uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, really, for the next couple of quarters, uh, buybacks is not something that's that's a big priority for us. So I, I don't know that we'll be participating in that, uh, at least for the next couple of quarters. In this environment, um, you know, our stance really is more around uh, preserving and growing capital. And, uh, you know, we're pleased to see those capital levels uh, move on up. So we'll kind of continue that approach. Okay. And, and then what, what about potentially um, – uh, rejiggering the the bond book, uh, given you know things are a lot much a lot uh, calmer versus uh, March and April. Um, is there any appetite to use some of the excess capital towards that? 
Yeah, I think there is, and, and that's a great question. And uh, so that's something that you know we've looked at through this environment and continue to look at. Not here today to announce that we're executing on anything per se, but I, I think it's a, a fair expectation to have that we would certainly look very seriously at doing something like that in the second half of this year. Okay, great. Thanks very much. You bet. Next up is Katherine Miller, KBW. Thanks. Um, a question on the margin. It, it feels like from your margin guidance, we're going to be ending the year somewhere around uh, 315 to 320, I think depending on you know where the deposit remix shakes out. And as you think about next year, um, which I know we're try just trying to get this year done, but as we think about next year, as we're exiting the year around that kind of margin level. What, how do you think about higher for longer and, and what type of, I don't know, kind of tailwinds you maybe will have on the loan portfolio or portfolio or maybe what some defenses you may have if we stay kind of at that 550 Fed funds through next year. Thanks. Yeah, you bet, Catherine. I, I think to kind of start the uh, the, uh, the narrative on that question is, you know, we, we talked just now about the potential restructuring of the bond portfolio. That could certainly, I think, be a nice lead in to 2024. And, and look, just depending on the rate environment, and kind of where we are with our deposit remix, you know, that'll play a big role and a big part in how we think about our NIM for next year. Uh, it certainly appears that um, deposit costs, you know, might be leveling out, and that's part of our uh, narrative and assumption for the second half of this year. And if that's the case and continues into next year, there's certainly the opportunity for CDs potentially to reprice a little bit lower next year. And then, uh, obviously, if the operating environment is a big is a bit better, uh, you know the, pot the potential certainly exists for us to add loan growth next year. So, um, so again, pre bit premature to talk about you know, strict guidance for 2024, but uh, but those are the things I think we kind of think about in that regard. John, anything you want to add? Yeah, yeah, Catherine, this is John. Uh, this this is this is obviously not easy to model, but just. Thinking about conceptually how the, the higher for longer environment could uh, could affect our book, um, we have about two, maybe three quarters, uh, maybe two and a half quarters of growth out of sort of all things real estate. Um, you know, we have a, a pretty big C and D book and a really excellent team that's that's done great with terrific quality and good spreads for a long time, but that pipeline uh, is crimping a bit. And so the growth we see in C and D on slide eight is really more driven by draws on existing projects. So uh, as those projects are completed, uh, a minority of that book will move into real estate and a good bit of it will get sold off in the permanent finance markets. Um, ditto mortgage, those projects come out uh, if they're a resi construction project, get reclassed into mortgage, and then begin to amortize. And right now about 90% um, of our applications are directed to the secondary market on mortgage. So um, when you sort of apply all that together, between that and the disciplined pricing and conservative credit um, appetite that we have at middle market, corporate, and, uh, and certainly on syndications, there should be some repatriation of liquidity next year out of that sector of the portfolio back, and the intent is to deploy that in more granular, better spread and less lumpy areas that are better for margin. Uh, we're also getting about $2 of liquidity to a buck of lending in those small business side uh, sectors. So um, so I think, I don't want to you know, talk about 24 too much, Catherine, but there is some self-generated relief in liquidity next year. And if the, uh, the, the policy folks don't continue taking as much money out of the system as they have the last 12 months, and with bank rates uh, being more competitive versus treasuries, um, you know, those massive amounts of exit from the banking system uh, to federal instruments should begin to wane some. So how all that mixes together um, should, and if the Fed stops raising rates as, uh, uh, as we all hope they will here in the back half of the year, then we should see a little bit better picture in 24 for stability. Um, both portfolio and spread and NIM, if, if that all makes sense. So too early for 24 right now, but that's just the tone. That, that, that's very helpful, very helpful. And then, John, you hinted that there was some CD repricing to be aware of in the back half of the year. Can you just remind us of, of what that looks like? 
Uh, Catherine, this is my back half of 23. Yes. Yeah, so we have about a billion two of CDs in maturing in the third quarter. Those are coming off at about 386. And then in the fourth quarter, we have about 900 million of CDs maturing, and those are coming off at right at about 4%. We also have about $500 million of the brokered CDs that we added back in March that will be coming off in the month of December. Those are coming off at 545. So those are the CD maturities we have in the second half. And, and so, you know, and that that story, I think I used the words NIM story uh, earlier, uh, Catherine, the, uh, if we, we were a little more hopeful that we would not see another rate increase, and I think the tone from the Fed as uh, uh, here lately sounds as if that's that's in the cards for July. Um, whether there's another one, you know, we'll, we don't know yet. But our, we had hoped that we would have a little bit more room to reprice those down. Um, the guidance presumes that we don't. So we're trying to, to play realistic ball in terms of the Fed does raise rates again, and perhaps even again, um, and tightening continues, then the competitiveness around us for CD rates may not relent until after the end of the year. And if that happens, our ability to reprice down from the levels Mike mentioned really is challenged. And so the change in guidance is really more uh, derivative of that tone, not because anything's not going well or anything like that. It's just to simply the, the where the competition does not appear to be getting any easier as we look at the next six months or so. Okay, Got it. Helpful. That makes sense. Yep, that, make, that makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. And then maybe one last one. Just I know there was one commercial MPL that uh, increased this quarter. If you could just give us a little bit of color on that. Chris, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, Catherine, it's Chris Luca. Um, yeah, it was uh, a credit that we've been tracking for a while, and uh, it kind of migrated from criticized to NPL, which is why you don't see the uh, the criticized going up uh, at all, really. Um, and, and frankly, it's just a customer in the um, kind of retail space. It's a C store operator that um, probably just uh, overexpanded a little bit, so they're kind of going through a, a little bit of a restructuring ourselves, and so therefore we uh, needed to move it into the NPL category. Great, great, thank you. You bet. Thank you, Catherine. Your next question comes from Brett Rabbiton of the group. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, wanted to first start on fee income and just the guidance, you know, the change there, link quarter, if that was a function of um, less annuity fee growth than you, maybe you were expecting or if there were dynamics in the back half of the year that resulted in that change. Yeah, great question. This is John. A great question, and, and you're pretty right on top of it. <clears throat> the uh, the guidance change is really uh, sort of like in the deposit conversation we just had uh, with the prior question. Um, when we look at the effect of higher rates for longer, there are two areas of the fee income buckets that should see less activity. So it's not our lack of of uh, appreciation for the sector is just the reality that we will likely sell less annuities the back half of the year um, than we sold in the front. We had a terrific year uh, 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 up until now, but when we look at less traffic uh, with the pie of opportunity shrinking a bit in both annuities and in uh, uh, non-amortized loan fees, if we're, if we're doing less lumpy loans, then you get less fees that you bring to the bottom line that same quarter. And so with, with a little bit more anemic outlook for that traffic for the back half of the year, uh, we resized the guidance down a bit to accommodate it. So n nothing going particularly wrong, no, no threat, um, just trying to be uh, thoughtful uh, and ensure that we're being as transparent as we can about the chatter we're getting back uh, when we look at competitive assessment and the outlook for opportunities. So if, if the opportunities were the same as they had been, we, we wouldn't have changed the guidance. So it really is just an issue of the pie getting smaller. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and, and then just wanted to make sure I understood, you know, the, the thought process around the competitive environment. You know, I think last quarter, you know, banks kind of felt like things were settling down, you know, into earnings season in April after the, the crazy March. And, and I feel like everyone kind of realized a, a ratcheting higher in com competitiveness in, in May and June and just was curious if, if it felt like it was still ratcheting higher in terms of where, what you're seeing promotional activity in your markets 
or if it maybe it adds a little bit since the maybe the heavy uh, period of late May. Is your question specific to deposit pricing, Brett? Just to make sure we hear you right. Yes, yes. This, yeah, just to deposit pricing and and what you're seeing in your markets in terms of your competitors' pricing. Yeah. Oh, this is Mike. I think you hit the nail on the head there. And certainly over the course of the second half of the second quarter, we we saw that ratcheting up of uh, primarily deposit pricing competition. Um, a couple of folks, you know, have kind of stepped out there. So. Um, that more or less, uh, I, I think, has kind of calmed down a bit. We certainly don't see that getting any worse, you know, as we move into the first couple of weeks of July. Okay, great. And then maybe one, one last quick one. You know, one of the pushbacks I get on on Hancock is just the markets might not perform as well in a recession. So I was just curious what you were seeing economically and. Some of the coastal markets, you know, how New Orleans was behaving. Um, you know, I know that um, Jazz Fest was probably the best one ever in, in, in May. So I know there's been some some solid tourism. Yeah, well, I hope you came down to visit. It was a, it was a good show this uh, this season. But, but really, our markets, you can kind of bifurcate the markets into the high growth markets like in, uh, in, uh, in, in the larger MSAs of Texas. Uh, and then in Florida, where they've had such massive inflow of population in the COVID uh, pandemic and pandemic recovery area, those would sort of be in one group and then a little bit slower growth there in the core of the area, but very dependable. So uh, in, in the last recessive period, uh, we, we were really pleased with how uh, those books performed. I mean, we, we had a bad time with energy, but it was not because of the economies in our markets. It was because we had too high of a concentration at a bad time. The uh, uh, the markets actually in themselves performed well, and, and as you saw, once we jettisoned the book, the AQ measures were actually quite superior. So um, I think we have a lot of confidence in the sentiment being positive, and when we talk to our clients, uh, particularly the larger clients, you know, four or five months ago or so, there was a lot more, and when I say concern, I don't mean concern like hand-wringing, but just uh, very, very mindful of the risk that if the Fed's increase in rates was so steep and so long and kept going, that we could see that proverbial hard landing. We really don't hear that kind of concern from our clients anymore. So uh, they may be tightening down a bit to grow capital and to uh, preserve liquidity and to get as much re return as they can for it. But it's not fear of an economic downturn. It's just more respectfulness of a slower economy that may lead, lead to slower opportunities for them to, to gather revenue. So uh, I think we're in a great part of the country to go through a recessive period. I hope we don't have one. But, uh, but I feel good about it. Uh, the tourism this summer has been off the hook, really across our overall footprint. Uh, New Orleans that suffered mightily during the pandemic because the uh, convention center and, and, uh, and family tourism economies shut down hard in 20, and really only family came back in 21, then everything began opening back up in 22. It's fully back. I mean, restaurants are full, uh, reservation lists are long, the convention center's running a brisk business, the festivals are all back. Um, the only thing that's not, I guess, back to its original form is the number of attendees per convention or trade show is still 15, 20% off where it was. Um, and I don't think the cause of that is any worry about the city of New Orleans. I think it's just more that's a, a, a tendency we're seeing throughout the country. And uh, so I, I hope that kind of gives you the tone of a lot of confidence in our markets. We actually feel pretty good about. That's great. That's very helpful. Thanks for all the color. You bet. Thank you. Kevin Fitzsimmons from DA Davidson is up next. Hey, good good afternoon, guys. How are you? Hey, Kevin. Um, just one one thing I wanted to ask about the margin. I know you know it's been very clear that there's ongoing margin compression ahead, maybe at a less of a pace than what we've seen in the second quarter. But I was a little actually encouraged to see the the margin for the month of June was equal to the full quarter margin, if I saw that right, um, as opposed to it being lower, like like I think we're used to seeing um, indicating, you know, it coming going lower, coming out of the quarter. And I was just curious whether any unusual items driving that or, 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 or is that a source of encouragement? Yeah, Kevin, this is Mike. Yeah, that's correct. Our our NIM for the month of June came in at 330. 
which as you pointed out was equal to uh, what we're reporting what we are reporting for the quarter so yeah that is encouraging and I think that speaks probably as much as anything else to the fact that you know we do see deposit costs kind of leveling out a, a bit um, you know certainly I think there's there's more of that to come in the second half of the year in fact if we look at the uh, the increases in our cost of deposits for the second half of the year compared to the first half of the year of the year much less. So in the first half of the year we had about 90 basis points or so of uh, of increased deposit costs. We think that'll be roughly about half of that in the second half of the year. And and again those are broad numbers, but um, but yeah you are correct. I, I do think and believe that that the uh, the NIM compression will lessen as we go through the rest of the year. And really the primary driver and probably the biggest wild card will be the continued level of uh, NIB remix. If uh, if that lets up a bit for whatever reason as we go through the second half of the year, then obviously I think that bodes well for us coming in at maybe the lower end of the NIM compression range that I gave in the prepared comments. And, and Mike, the... You know, I'm, I'm assuming you're you're tracking on a you know, obviously quarterly, but monthly, weekly this the the, uh, the um, deposit remix. But I guess it can it, it's hard to draw conclusions on it if you see it settling a bit because it can be very chunky, right? So if we have a Fed hike, then that could lead to a big chunk, and then it's a question of if we have more hikes after that. Um, but I guess I guess are we do we get at a certain point? Even if there are more hikes, do we get to a point where just the nature of those accounts uh, that you have um, that that st- that outflow would would decline because who who's left in there that hasn't taken it out? I guess. Yeah, I mean that's that's a great point, and and obviously you're right. I mean we watch that very closely. You could even say on a daily basis, but and, and there was a point during the quarter where we thought there was a bit of a fighting chance for maybe for the quarter to show a little bit lessening of that remix. But if you look at the percentage numbers, in the first quarter that remix was about 3.5%, in the second quarter pretty much 3.5%, maybe just a tad lower than that. Um, But the other thing, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that we watch very carefully is kind of the average balance per account. And again, as I mentioned, that's still a bit higher now compared to where it was in, in the second quarter. So really for that to end up in the rearview mirror, we think that either lower rates or some combination of lower rates and that average deposit balance coming down to pre-pandemic levels, we, we think will um, we'll, we'll spell kind of the end of the remix or the beginning of the end, if you will. And what do you Kevin, think you might triggers that, that average balance per count to go to? Is that just being stubbornly high because there's just less activity going on. Well, People I mean, aren't putting it, money to work. Yeah, it's, it's obviously coming down and has come down, not only for us, but uh, but for most banks. Um, but it still is, you know, meaningful higher right now than it was on a pre-pandemic basis. Kevin, that, that's something that I think has to play out. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I stepped in. No, go ahead. Uh, Kevin, this is John. I, I can't remember which quarter it was. Uh, it's 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 may have been as long as a year ago we had said that uh, when we when we apply uh, both the type of account the gap to the pre-pandemic average balance and the spending rate uh, both for things people want and then later what they need uh, it trended to be about literally June of 2024 when we would reach the pre-pandemic average balance uh, uh, in, a, in a pretty complex piece of algebra and that's that's really still where it seems to be heading now. Uh, at that time, uh, we didn't see a five and a quarter overnight money rate materializing at this at the pace that it did. And so, one would think that we would be getting a little closer to that average balance if it's if it's really the new bottom uh, sooner than June, simply because we're already seeing as we monitor traffic and tone from clients, uh, the spending habits of consumers has certainly changed to, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're doing more trips than uh, than buying bigger houses right now. So the sources and uses of cash have changed a bit in 23 versus 22, which should suggest we should be getting closer to the average balances by the end of the year. But, but I mean, picking those behavioral trends and trying to blend them into a forecast is, is, is not you know easy for us to do, and so 
uh, we truly simply uh, extrapolated the behavior we're seeing right now, uh, uh, tried our best to migrate what we thought that book would look like by the end of the year and guided to it. And we, we take no pleasure in guiding to anything that's not positive, but the environment we're in and the, and the competitors that we have who are loaned up way too close to 100%. Um, they, you know, we, we want liquidity. They have to have liquidity and they're pricing accordingly and, and that's driving some of our costs up a little faster than we would like to have seen them. So our, our thought of normalization may be a little bit further, uh, maybe over, you know, past year in and into 24 versus uh, back half of this year like we had hoped a quarter or so ago. That may John, be more detail. One, one, that's great, John. And one last one for me. The, you mentioned earlier how the level of borrowings has come down. That was an abundance of caution post the bank failures, and now you've kind of uh, taken that off. Should we assume that level of borrowings at second quarter end remains fairly stable, or could there be more moves in that line item? Yeah, Kevin, this is Mike again. I, I think we're more or less back to managing the balance sheet in a normal fashion. So uh, the level of liquidity we, we uh, kept on the balance sheet of June 30th may be a bit higher than what we would normally do, but not much more than a couple hundred million or so. So maybe that comes down a little bit more, but I, I don't know that that's a, uh, a significant number. Okay, great. Thanks very much. You bet. Thank you for the questions. We'll go next to Brandon King, Truth Securities. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to know what your expectation was for the pace of increases in loan yields on the balance sheet. I saw there was a 27 basis point benefit in the quarter, and new loan yields are coming on at 7.4%. So I wanted to know to what extent could you potentially offset some of this deposit pricing pressure over the next couple of quarters? Yeah, Brandon, this is Mike. I mean, that's absolutely part of uh, what we're thinking about for the second half of the year. Uh, you know, certainly our earning asset yields will move up as the uh, the Fed raises rates. Um, we have a very focused effort also on improving our loan yields, both on new-to-bank business as well as uh, renewals. So that's something that's a big, big focus on what we're trying to accomplish and I think is part uh, of our assumptions as we think about maybe less NIM compression in the second half of the year versus the first half of the year. Related to the bond portfolio, aside from, you know, a potential restructuring, no change in how we think about uh, reinvesting back in the bond portfolio right now will continue at least for the next couple of quarters and maybe beyond with letting those cash flows and maturities help fund loan growth and other needs on the balance sheet. So, um, so I think that's how we think about those things. John, anything you want to add on the loan side? No, the only thing I'd add, Mike, uh, I think I did a great job on the answer. Uh, Brandon, the, the uh, I mean, it's a very astute question and point. Um, and, and while I don't want to be tempted to get too far into 2024, um, you know, about, about half our book is fixed. Uh, and a lot of that fixed uh, book is going to begin, are going to continue renewing into, into 24. And so uh, at the point that the variable rate business planes off a bit from the indexed increases as, uh, as the Fed uh, makes, uh, you know, 25 BIP increases, uh, we'll continue to see the fixed rate book expanding. And, and what hasn't happened yet in our industry, at least in our region, um, that I believe will start occurring is, you know, banks have settled into having a certain amount of, uh, of NIBs relative to revolving lines, especially on the commercial side. And if those balances continue to come down because people are prepared to pay the fee in the account uh, instead of uh, get those fees waived, then that does bring up the notion that we may see uh, the indexed prime on the revolvers begin to reprice up a little bit beyond uh, where they are today. I think just as banks settle, and when that happens, uh, we probably all move at about the same pace. So I think we may see better spreads against prime um, if prime stabilizes, and we may see, we will see the fixed rate uh, money actually get repriced higher as we go into the next year. So if deposits do stabilize toward the, uh, the end of the year, uh, and the competition from T bills has uh, has waned from where the ferocious competition has been the past few quarters. 
then that does indicate that you know the NIM stored for 24, 25 may be a lot brighter than the, the compression we took in the 23. But I, I don't want to throw any numbers around at this point in time. We'll need to wait till we get a little close to the end of the year to talk about it, but that's kind of our outlook. Got it, got it, um, understood. And, and then I noticed C&I line utilization ticked a, a bit lower in the quarter, so just wanted to get some more context behind that. And if you're still seeing some of your customers kind of delever themselves uh, in this sort of economic environment and what they're anticipating. Sure, I'll I'll uh, I'll tackle that. This is John again, and look, I I love this business, and I'll talk too much about stuff like that because I really enjoy talking about it. So I hope I don't take up too much time or give you more detail. But ultimately, you know, there's three different classes of loans inside that revolver. Um, you've got we we have we're a real consumer bank, so we have a robust home equity line uh, business that uh, that is revolving, and, and those uh, uh, utilizations have been ticking downward really ever since uh, Prime got to about 100 basis points below where it is right now. So um, uh, volume of new applications has come down, I think, as people decide not to, to borrow uh, and put their home up to do it uh, for the time being. And the utilization actually has come down some as people traded that, some of those excess balances and paid down the debt because they didn't like the, the ticket price uh, on the revolver. Uh, the other area of utilization that's come down is just normal commercial utilization came down as rates went up. Uh, our commercial clients had a lot of liquidity. We have a great book of clients, and they used some of that liquidity to pay down the line and, and just opted to pay the fee on their analysis accounts. So you had those two of the three total sectors in, in, uh, in line utilization coming down. The contrary to that was on the construction side. Um, where as projects move through the pipeline, they start off on the first day at zero, and then they move up, you know, say 85 or 90 percent as they get to the completion of the project, and then it either flips out of the bank to perm or into real estate for a period of time until it leases up and the project is sold. So if the pipeline is a little bit crimped on the way in as new projects uh, volume comes down, then there's a natural utilization increase that occurs as the average project gets closer to completion. So if you follow me with all those three right now, the downward pressure from consumer revolvers and, and commercial revolving lines of credit are offsetting the increase that we're getting on the construction utilization side. And so that will continue for a couple of quarters until it eventually normalizes. Is that, does that, is that where you were headed with your question? Yeah, 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 yeah that makes sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, thank you so much for taking my question. You bet. Thank you. Your next question is Stephen Scouton, Piper Sandler. Hey, good afternoon. Appreciate the time here. Um, I wanted to follow up, uh, just going back to that CD conversation. I know you said uh, you know, there might not be as much room to reprice those lower as you thought at one point in time. Can you give us a feel for where you saw new CDs um, come on out at a percentage basis this quarter? Yes, Steve, and this is Mike. What, what I can share with you that, that that probably is equally as useful is kind of where our current rates are. So, you know, that gives you a little bit of insight into where we think those maturities may land. So uh, the highest rate we have right now is a five and a quarter at eight months. We also have a 5% at three months. But then we also have a little bit longer maturities, nine and 11 months at four and a half and 4% respectively. So um, I, I think where those maturities uh, land in terms of uh, people re-upping, you know, their CDs will depend a little bit on their outlook for rates. So, you know, if people want to lock in a little bit lower rate for a bit longer than uh, some of the damage to our NIM related to the CD maturities won't be as bad. You know, if folks opt to stay short and higher, you know, then obviously that's a little pain that we have to endure. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I have a, a question kind of around um, your asset sensitivity modeling. And this is just something, you know, I've been curious about this industry wide, really. But, you know, you still screen as asset, asset sensitive. I think it's, what was it, up 1.9% and up 100 basis points. But obviously, in the near term, the balance sheet isn't really reacting that way. So I'm wondering, what is it about the modeling that, that isn't encapsulated in, in real time? Is it just the, the pace of the deposit move? And would we actually see this play out if we do get stability in rates and get that back book repricing that, that John was speaking to a minute ago? 
Yeah, I think the short answer to, to your second question is yes. So we, we, we do think that that introduces some level of stability. And related to your first question, j just about the fact that we are, what we kind of describe as modestly asset sensitive. We have, you know, 59% of our loan book is uh, is variable. But probably the uh, the wild card through this cycle that really has been different compared to prior cycles um, that kind of interferes with, with some of the theory around you know, how an asset-sensitive bank might behave in a rising rate environment is really related, I think, to the non-interest-bearing remix uh, that, that's occurred, you know, on our balance sheet, obviously, as well as most other banks. So, um, you know, certainly no secret that if we go back a year or so ago, our NIB mix was nearly 50%. We had three quarters in a row where we were kind of at that 49, 50% level. And, uh, you know, now we're down to 40% in a couple of quarters, potentially 35% by the end of this year. So I do think that that introduces a little bit different variable that um, maybe distorts that, that modeling a little bit. So Got it. That, that makes up. a lot of sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that. And then just last thing for me, I know you said earlier you know, kind of expense management is an institutional mindset at this point. But I'm wondering, you know, obviously, given the difficult revenue environment, is that something that you take an even deeper and closer look at, maybe a more, you know, the potential for a more fulsome expense plan or anything along those lines? Do, do you see that in, in future quarters by any chance? Yeah, I, I think so. But again, you know, keep in mind our, our commentary narrative around continuing to reinvest back in the company. So, you know, as a reminder, back in the days of the uh, the pandemic back in 2020, you know, we were really one of the first banks that, that really made a concerted effort to use the pandemic as a period to to get a lot more efficient. And, and that resulted in a pretty pretty significant decrease in our expense run rate and a uh, pretty, pretty nice increase, obviously, in our efficiency. In fact, our efficiency ratio actually went slightly below 50% uh, just a couple of quarters ago. So that, that's something that we, we know how to do, and that's what I mean, what we mean when we say that expense management is really kind of institutionalized at our company. But again, in this environment, we also see the opportunity to reinvest, and so that's important to us as well. So, so the notion of being able to cut expenses or save expenses so that we can be efficient and also have room to re reinvest back in the company, those things are very important to us. John, anything you want? Yeah, to not, not to belabor uh, the the question any further, but uh, but Stephen, there, you know, we gave that target of fifty five percent out there, and while it's in the CSOs, uh, well, we're really not not a, not pleased to see it go above fifty five at all, even though we haven't gotten to the CSO period. But uh, uh, I mean, the drivers for that are are uh, largely deposit pricing, the compression on them. Um, and FDIC insurance expenses are just a lot more expensive in 23 than they were in 22, and we didn't you know, didn't expect that uh, you know a year ago, uh, but here we are. So all those things are uh, are real, they're true, and they don't matter. We still need to get back below 55 percent. So the I think our reality is uh, 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 not not to make it overly dramatic, but we kind of go up a DEFCON level, so to speak, when we get above 55. And so there will be curtailments in discretionary expenses that will be implemented uh, as we move along. And, uh, and if the benefit of continuing in our reinvestment pace outweighs some of the pain of doing some of the more uh, across the board uh, uh, expense curtailments, then, then we'll, we're not bashful about making that call. Uh, uh, our goal, though, and is you know we don't think about everything in quarters. We think of it in years, and it's very important that our company is in super and very strong shape to execute and, be, and play very offensive ball when the economy turns and we start seeing a, a better opportunity to grow. And so, um, you know, I don't want to curtail uh, investments to the degree that we will wish we hadn't. You know, a year or two down the road. So we're still adding bankers. We're still adding technology. Uh, but uh, the pace with which we're doing it is going to need and require some belt tightening elsewhere. So not ready to talk about those techniques and all that now, but it's all the things that you would imagine based on our, our history of being pretty good at managing expenses. Yeah, that's extremely helpful. Thank you all for the time and, and color. You bet. Thanks for the questions. 
We'll go next to Christopher Marinek, Jenny Montgomery Scott. Thanks for hosting the call today. Um, a quick question for Chris on the criticized assets. Uh, I, I see that they were stable, obviously, this quarter, but just curious kind of what's out there that would cause that trend to either go down in a good way or perhaps see some inflection uh, with uh, deterioration in future periods. Yeah, good question, uh, Christopher. Um, you know, we're not really seeing any specific sector-related, uh, you know, uh, confluence of events. Um, obviously, we're operating at a, a historically low level on, on the criticized loan level. So, you know, there's probably, you know, little chance of substantial improvement from where we are. But, you know, our goal, obviously, is to maintain as high asset quality as we can. Um, you know, I think some of the some of the sectors that are always going to have pressure are the ones that have had to absorb, uh, you know, the wage increases and some of the higher higher operating costs associated um, with some of the inflation that uh, is starting to cool off, but obviously has not come down. So they're having to kind of manage through that as well as uh, companies that, um, you know, are maybe having some continued staffing challenges just because of the uh, relatively low uh, unemployment rate. So, you know, I think those are the sectors that we keep an eye on. Um, we're not necessarily seeing any significant or any sort of uh, connected issues, um, you know, in any one sector, but we pay particular attention to those that are getting, you know, squeezed from a margin perspective. And also uh, the higher interest rates, you know, if they have fixed rate debt, you know, they're going to have to obviously absorb when they renew um, the higher interest rate for that, uh, for that debt at renewal. So we're looking at that closely as well. Are those drivers for potential changes to the reserve, you know, beyond where you're positioned now? Um, I mean, not really. I mean, it could could be, okay. but generally speaking, um, you know, we are, you know, factoring that into the decisions that we take. Um, you know, we think that the reserve is is uh, adequate for um, the risks that we have in the portfolio. So, um, you know, our, our objective is to kind of, you know, match the reserve to any sort of direction of risk uh, in the portfolio, either uh, as it increases or decreases. So, so I would say, generally speaking, no. Great. Uh, my follow-up uh, is from Mike Ackery. It just has to do with kind of your longer-term experience on kind of the length of your deposit relationships. I'm just thinking out a couple quarters. If we get some stability on pricing, kind of trying to reassess the how to value the franchise and you know, the sort of funding advantage that you've always had. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, I assume you're talking about our NIB mix and the, the, the long-term stability related to that. And, uh, sure. And it, so. Yeah, and if so, um, yeah, look, that's been a hallmark of our companies and uh, continues to be, you know, and while, you know, that, that NIB mix has certainly come down, you know, to where it is now from a peak of nearly 49%, you know, we think and believe that, you know, when the cycle is done, that where our mix ends up will still be, you know, an enviable position and, and certainly we would think it would be top quartile. So that's something that uh, we're very focused on, and um, you know we, we think and believe again that will continue to be a hallmark of our company and our balance sheet. Great, thanks for taking all of our questions today. Sure, you bet. Next up is Matt Olney Stevens. Yeah, thanks. Just want to follow up on that loan growth discussion and that one-time closed product that drove the 2Q growth. Uh, I appreciate this was kind of a reclassification um, as far as the driver, but I'm curious about the product itself. Are these loans all originated by the bank, and then when they move from construction into the mortgage classification, do any of the terms of the loan change? Uh, not, not many at all. Uh, they're pretty much fixed, but the uh, the volume of that, just to make sure I, I, I explained it clearly, about 60% of that number was the reclass, but the pipeline is zero and has been zero for some time. So uh, what we see in, in that category is largely 
uh, the, the the back quarter of the snake, or the back the back quarter of the egg going through the snake, so to speak. And so I think we're uh, probably two quarters away from that uh, beginning to fall pretty dramatically, and then the portfolio itself begins to shrink as we go into into twenty four. Did, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, th that's that's helpful. And, and then just just one more follow up here for for Mike on the discussion of those time deposits for pricing the back half of the year. Uh, I heard those current offering rates that are out there um, that you disclosed. Uh, I'm curious if the current guidance assumes those are the roll-on rates, uh, kind of in line with those promotional rates that you mentioned, or does it assume uh, some other type of roll-on rate for those time deposits? No, uh, Matt, it absolutely assumes some combination of those current rates you know, along with a um, a, uh, a re-up uh, uh, number that we have in mind, so around 80% or so. So we think of roughly 80% of our CDs will reprice into some configuration of the current rates that I gave on those CDs. Okay. Okay, great. That's all for me. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions. And everyone, at this time, there are no further questions. I'll hand things back to management for additional or closing remarks. Sure. Th thanks, Lisa, to you.